Well, I'm so glad that Greg and uh, Gail Dill are here with us. Uh, uh, Greg uh, and Gail run Teen Challenge in the state of Louisiana and have a, a tremendous ministry down there. But, you know, one of the things that I've really admired about Greg is those of us that are, I can say it, younger. I'll say it. We're younger. Uh, you know, we, we want to look and see how do, how do you last? How do you continue on? Like what I was talking about this morning. And, and one of the things that I love about Brother Greg is he is, he is always just steady as can be. And uh, that is extremely important in the type of work that we do because there's a lot of disappointment that's baked into what we do. And the ability to continue marching forward and being steady and being faithful and keeping your eyes on the prize and not letting those little grenades that happen in our life throw you off track. We need to see people, and I thank God for you, we need to see people like you guys that are faithful. And you're going to talk about that this morning, how to survive disaster. So would you please welcome Greg Dill. My clicker? Okay. Yes. All right. This thing right here do wonders for your ego. I got a clicker. I'm that guy with a clicker. Always wanted to be that guy. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we just need to pray for Brother Jonathan that he can just up his passion for ministry a little bit more. Um, his enthusiasm, you know, uh, hopefully will be contagious to all of us. Amen. amen. I, uh, man, thank you so much, Jonathan, for uh, letting me come and share. Um, you know, hopefully I've got something that'll be uh, worthwhile for you to have taken time out of your schedule, uh, arranged, uh, you know, just everything uh, for you to be here. And um, I hope that any presenter that would ever present anywhere for any reason uh, would approach their time, you know, with that uh, desire, you know, that the people that are going to be listening, that it's worthwhile for them to have come. And uh, so I, I want this to be worthwhile for you. So um, I love to talk. Uh, I love to, uh, to preach. My wife is sitting strategically in front of me uh, to help me to move along uh, in case, you know, I want to make sure that we do have time and Jonathan wants us to have time. Uh, for questions, so uh, we want to make sure that we do that. Um, yeah, how to, how to survive. How do I survive disaster? Um, stay in ministry or maybe in any phase of life long enough and <laughs> you're going to have a situation. Um, so how, how do I survive that? And, you know, when Jonathan first gave me the opportunity to say yes or no, uh, I said yes, and then he said, well, what are you going to talk on? And I said, I don't know, man, let me get back to you. Um, so I prayed, and this is really what God had put in my heart. And, you know, this guy is just a you know, phenomenal planner, so he didn't invite me three weeks ago, probably three months ago. Uh, and uh, now he wouldn't know that by how quick or how late I got my PowerPoint to him. I probably had him sweating. Um, but, and I had ample time. And against my nature, and if you know me as a person, you'll know that this is not my character at all. That's probably why God had me put the brakes on it. But, you know, I knew that I wanted to talk about this just, you know, because Gail and I have had our times, and, and, and you'll hear about that in a minute. You know, but I started to try to wow, you know, so that I'll look impressive, that I'll be, man, I'm sure glad I invited Greg to come talk. You know, man, I'll make sure I have him again. You know, I wanted to wow. So I wanted, you know, when I first started this thing, you know, how do I survive disaster? I wanted to try to get into some kind of a psychological help. You know, well, what do real psychologists say, you know, about new coping skills and, and how you can do all these things to survive disaster. And then, you know, pretty quick, I realized, Greg, that ain't you. You're not smart enough to read that kind of stuff. You're not smart enough to put it down in notes. You're not smart enough to deliver it with any kind of educated, you know, uh, appearance. You're Greg Dill. You're from New Orleans all your life. You're a product of Orleans Perry school system, you know. So, <laughs> Greg, that ain't going to work. So I said, God, you're right. That ain't going to work. That was even stupid of me to even think that it would. So, you know, what we're going to do today is uh, I'm going gonna, gonna to share Gail and I's journey with you. Amen? Uh, from the beginning. And um, this is how you know. See, I bragged on myself about having a clicker. All right. I'm going to make sure that I know how to use the clicker. If you got it, Greg, you better know how to use it. Nehemiah 1.4, if you're a pastor in here and you've had a building program, 
or Teen Challenge and you, you know, have a capital campaign, you know, we always run to this. Uh, and uh, it's the go-to scripture for building, but it's really the go-to uh, scripture for the point that we're going to go into that uh, Jonathan almost preached. I, I showed Gail, I don't know, I was paying attention, but he started to preach my first point, and I showed her my notes and his word for word. I said, he stole my PowerPoint. What is he doing? So you'll see that in a minute. Anyway, Nehemiah 1.4, when I heard these things, you know, obviously Nehemiah, when I've heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. No plan will work if there is not a God-given call. That was my first thought. And because I'm Greg Dill, I realized, you know what? There is a better thought than that. No plan will work until we discover what God has planned as our calling. No plan will work. Come up with all the plans you want, but if you're trying to plan it around something that's not God's plan for your life, your chance of success is based on how intelligent you are, how gifted you are, how charismatic you are. There may be some measure of success. For me, it would have been zero because I'm none of those things. The only reason I joke about this, I know it's God's plan and God's design, but I didn't get to be CEO of Louisiana Adult and Teen Challenge because there was a board of directors that were very intelligent men, and I, set, I sent my very impressive resume to them. They vetted me over a dozen other really you know, talented men of God that were vying for the same position, and then they narrowed it down to five, then they narrowed it down to three, then they narrowed it down to Greg Dill. That's not my story. That would have been impressive. I'd have been able to hold my chest out a little bit. Maybe that's why God let me make my journey, so I keep my chest low. There's nothing prideful to me. I got here because I just didn't quit. I got to be the boss because I outlasted every other boss. If I'm transparent, that's why I'm behind this mic. <laughs> Somebody else isn't. I outlasted everybody else. Everybody else didn't learn the lesson. No plan will work until we discover what God has planned for our calling. I can't even, if you don't get anything else out of this hour, get that. You will not survive any kind of a real disaster. And you're going to see the ones that Gail and I travel through together. Small things can take you out. If you're not convinced you're where God has called you to be, where God has intended for you to be, a small thing can take you out, much less a real big disaster come. You know, God forbid a real bad one come. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll refocus you. It'll, it'll get you to shift gears and go somewhere else. And then you don't get to have the mic. <laughs> or the clicker. There needs to be a time where we can look back and say with certainty, God has spoken. Don't make a move. Don't leave Bible school until God has spoken. Don't leave your job until God has spoken. That's, that's job transfer 101. Don't go to another job until you have another one lined up, right? Don't leave your job until God has spoken. Our last point will have to do with relationship, uh, but we'll come back to this too. There needs to be a time when you can look back and say with certainty, God has spoken. God wants to and will birth his plan for us in our hearts. Prayer will get it into our spirit. Sit down. Stay in that posture until God speaks. Let God birth it in your heart. And then as you prayerfully 
What did our first scripture say? Nehemiah sat for days and prayed and wept. And then if you go on, and you may be familiar with the whole story, after that moment, he got up and started walking in his purpose. There was no more tears. There was no more, you know, oh, God. There was boldness. There was authority. There was decisions already made, and he walked in those decisions. But that came out of prayer will get it into your spirit. And man, once it's in your spirit, if it's truly given to you by God, if in prayer you get it into your spirit, you'll be able to survive disasters. That doesn't make them easy. It makes them survivable. And there, there's going to be that distinction. You know, Gail and I cried a lot. We prayed a lot. We were worried, and we'll get to that also in a minute. We were worried a lot. But because it was in our spirits, we were able to carry on. This is the foundation that will allow you to survive disaster. A difficult situation will have the potential to distort or cloud where you thought you should be. Gail and I prayed and waited to see how God was going to resolve the situation because he had called us to New Orleans. What time do I need to stop, Jonathan? Is that clock accurate? What time do I need to stop? Okay. All right. Gail and I, we met in Bible school. Teen Challenge had a three-year institute in Sunbury, Pennsylvania. She came sideways from Baltimore. I came north from New Orleans. Uh, we, uh, we were in school for three years. We got engaged in our second year. Uh, we dated and stayed engaged. Uh, thankfully, we stayed engaged for the third year. Uh, we both decided we were going to finish school before we got married, so no distractions. You know, we were here. We were called individually. Let's finish individually, and then we'll get married. So we got married in 1981. Uh, the summer prior to that graduation, I would go home every summer. I would go visit the center in New Orleans, you know, where I had gone through. And the director there had offered me a job. He said, look, man, when you finish, New or you know, when you finish college, I would really you know, like for you to come back to New Orleans and work. And uh, I prayed. I didn't know what God had for me. I didn't know Teen Challenge was even in the picture. I was just walking the journey. That's just a whole other story. But I didn't, I didn't have anything past Bible school. I just knew God had called me to Bible school and that Greg needed to complete Bible school. That was my mission at the time. So I prayed about it. And in my spirit, I clearly thought that New Orleans Teen Challenge was where I needed to be. So much so, and I hope Gail remembers this because I remember it like it was yesterday. I knew that we were getting, you know, close to that moment. And I told her, I said, listen, we're, we're getting serious about this. And I need you to know that I am definitely called to New Orleans Teen Challenge. And God is my witness. I was willing to not marry someone who I was really hoping to marry if she didn't have the same feeling. Because God's calling was more important than that marriage. I couldn't risk not fulfilling what God had placed in my heart because I had some very attractive young girl who was attracted, apparently. She was talking to him and she let me kiss her. <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> Hold on, man. I thought we were friends. I know we just met yesterday, but gee. She would actually like me. And that was rare for me that a good girl would actually be interested. But I was willing to put the brakes on a marriage if it wasn't going to line up. And then she, being a Yankee that she is, didn't answer me right away, just stood kind of bold. And she said, well, let me ask you something. I'm called to Teen Challenge, not necessarily a particular center like you said you are, but I don't want to marry you. If you're going to be a pastor a year later, I don't want you to drag me to New Orleans and wind up being a pastor because I know I am not called to be a pastor's wife. Now, if you're a pastor's wife, please, we're not demeaning that. That just wasn't her calling. 
She even jokes. She says, I am not going to learn how to play the piano. You got to be a pastor's <laughs> wife to play the piano. I'm not going to wear a dress every Sunday. Old school Pentecostal. And she said, you got to promise me. And that kind of took me back. I said, wait, I'm in charge of this conversation. We're talking about going to New Orleans, and now you're turning it on me. So the godly man I am, I came up with an incredible answer. And it just sealed the deal. And I thought for a minute, and I said, man, how am I answer this? I want her to marry me. I want her to go to New Orleans. And I said, babe, I don't know if I said babe or not. Maybe I did. If God calls us, he'll call us together. <laughs> it won't be me telling you I'm going to be a pastor and you fight that. If it's truly God, we'll get called together. And I guess that was a good enough answer because we got married in 81. We started teen, uh, working for Teen Challenge in 1981. So anyway, fast forward now that God, uh, through the situation, God has called us to New Orleans. On our honeymoon, I get a phone call from my mom that the director there is no longer the director there. And he's not sure if you're going to have a job. All of our stuff got trailered over to Teen Challenge. It's sitting where we're supposed to be living. And now I don't even know if I've got a job. I'm trying to enjoy myself on a honeymoon. And that's my, that's my entrance into ministry. That's day one of going into ministry. I don't even know if I'm at... I take her from her family, all of her friends, all of her family, traveled however many miles is from Baltimore to New Orleans. She doesn't know anybody. We don't know if we got a job. That's our entrance. What did we do? We prayed and we waited like, <laughs> all right, God, show up. That's one of the ways. We're going to see the steps. How do you survive? disaster stand still we didn't panic we didn't immediately start sending out resumes i'm a ship fitter by trade now i did go back to the shipyard for a while but that was just during the transition that god showed us how it was going to happen but we stood still and we just didn't get any other direction from god you can't survive disaster unless you stand still and pray. 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 Don't make fast decisions. Don't make rash decisions. Don't start trying to manipulate the situation and work angles. Stand still and pray. Just made my point, I guess. Resist doubt. <laughs> Maybe God didn't call me, really. Maybe I miss God. Man, as soon as you start doubting your calling, did it really get into your spirit? If it's in your spirit, if you truly prayed from your heart where God burst it, you prayed it into your spirit, when it's really truly there, don't doubt. Don't let your own mind or your own mind can raise doubt. Satan can speak to our minds. He can try to sidetrack you with doubt. However doubt comes, you can generate it yourself. It can be satanic. However it comes, it's still not right. Resist it. Don't panic. Whoa. All right, this isn't good. Right now, this is a little problematic. Like, how do we even get your stuff if we're not allowed on property? You know, what are we going to do with your stuff? Remind yourself the day has spoken to you. And let him reaffirm that word. Now, how is this only going to work if, if there was not a point where God did speak to you? How can you do, how can you remind yourself of the day that God spoke to you if there was not, is not that day? So again, I go back to what I said earlier. If you don't hear anything else, hear that first point. Let him reaffirm that word. God didn't tell us to do anything else. It was still New Orleans. We didn't know how. Be watchful. See how it's going to happen. This is big. A variation of that calling might present itself. 
but the variation of the original could be fatal. That's a big point. And I'm going to tell you why. Again, this is Gail and I's journey. I'm not smart enough for any of this stuff. I'm just put down on notes what happened to us. A variation of the calling. It might present itself. This variation of the original might could be fatal. The director moved on to Jimmy Swaggart Ministries, which is just an hour, Baton Rouge is an hour away from New Orleans. Jimmy Swaggart started, wanted to do the same thing that Marvin Gorman had done with Teen Challenge, and there was rivalry there, and we know how that ended, most of us. Um, but he started working for Jimmy Swaggart, and he said, Greg, come work with me with Jimmy Swaggart. And, I mean, not everybody across the nation or the world knew Marvin Gorman, but most people know the name Jimmy Swaggart. Brand new Bible school graduate. I get to work in the ministry run, you know, in, 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 a, in association with Jimmy Swaggart Ministries, worldwide ministries. And I prayed. And I got an answer. There is no deviation. And I told Bill Hudson was the director at the time. I said, Bill, man, I love you. He was the director there that spoke into my life the whole time, the year I was there. He's the one that encouraged me to go to Bible school. He's the one that spoke into my life saying, Greg, the day you walked into the building, I didn't think it was time for you then to hear what I'm telling you now. But I feel like God's got a full-time call on your life. And he encouraged me to go to Bible school. So this guy had an integral part in my life in the beginning. It would have been okay and natural to follow him. But God, God didn't change his plan. God spoke New Orleans and it didn't change. Amen. Had I followed him, he didn't last there a year. And he was out again. So where would I have been in a whole other city dragging this poor girl all over the place now? Again, not with any kind of a ministry. And then we all know what happened with him, you know, Jimmy Swagger and Marvin Gorman. Both of their ministries got blown up. Variation of the call might present itself. God spoke to me and told me to stay still. And we were able to survive that first thing. And that all happened in prayer. Pray, stand still. Prayer may seem trite, but it's actually the most powerful action that we can take. Don't let I'll just pray about it, which can easily sound trite. And us as Christians, we always say that, right? Sometimes that's just a Christian way of saying no. Hey, can you mow the grass today at the church? Oh, I'll pray about it. And that means, means just say no, you don't want to. But even still, it, it can sound trite because it's used so much. But it's the most powerful thing we can do. Thank God for counseling. There's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. Thank God for people that we can bounce ideas off of it. But at the end of the day, prayer is the most powerful thing. That's what's going to speak to you. That's what's going to keep you from getting derailed. Here we go. Don't let bitterness set in. Big disaster. Big one comes. Not your fault whatsoever. But that whole, your whole life is getting blown up because of a disaster. And it's not your fault. And if it's going to affect your livelihood, if it's going to affect your wife that we, you have a one son, one on the way, pregnant with the second one, and your whole life just got thrown into a tornado, this could easily be a human response. Resist that. Don't let bitterness set in. How's that going to happen, Greg? Easier said than done. I certainly agree. But can be done. Amen? Amen. How? Through prayer. Don't let the current circumstance cl cloud what God has told you. I love what it says in Peter's. Don't look on the peripheral. Don't let your gaze be left and right. Look up. 
Look up. I don't care what's going on. Yes, it's questionable. Yes, it stinks. Yes, I'm frightened. Yes to all of those emotions. But, but, God has called us. When Jimmy Swaggart and Marvin Gorman uh, situation happened, that was the original teen challenge in Louisiana. Gail and I were working for him. I was the director at the time. Again, outlasted three other directors um, just because I didn't go anywhere. And we're there. And Marvin Gorman asked me at one point, and this is when it was all going on, and uh, he just felt like it was the right thing to do to, you know, sue uh, the Assemblies of God. And I didn't even want to involve myself in any of the right and wrongs of all of that because I was called a teen challenge. <laughs> I just kept my head down. I'm called a teen challenge. I'm sorry. He called me in his office, and he wanted to know when I was going to turn my Assembly of God papers in. And I said, oh. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is the guy that's, you know, in charge of you. Uh, and I said, Brother Gorman, I love you. And I can't even imagine what you're having to go through right now. I can't even imagine how your life's been turned upside down. I can't even imagine with all the things that you're, all the emotions, everything that you're having to go through. But sir, I have to tell you with all due respect, I am not called to work for you, which was Marvin Gorman Ministries at the time. I'm not called to work for you. I'm called to work for Teen Challenge. And they're part of the Assemblies of God. With all due respect, I will not be turning my papers in. And that was the meeting I had with my boss. And I got up and I walked away. And it wasn't, I don't know, two days later, three days later, maybe a week, two people from his organization came to Teen Challenge where I was, you know, trying to hold things together there because the money had just disappeared. I was selling every plant we had in the building, I was selling it on the sidewalk to pay for gas in advance so I could bring the guys to church. That was my entrance into light industry for Teen Challenge. There was so many plants in there, people actually would stop in thinking it was a florist. And one day, you would always tell them, no, it's not for sale. And then they said, oh, one day I said, yeah, it is for sale. <laughs> <laughs> Stay focused on what God has spoken to you. Gail remembered this because I came home and told her, probably with tears in my eye, I might tear up just even thinking about it. In the backyard, in the middle of all of this uncertainty, God spoke to me. It wasn't audible, but it, and we've all probably had this experience. It was so loud in my head, so loud in my spirit, it might as well have been audible. Clearly, like it was a, someone standing next to me, I heard, don't worry about what man can do to you. Whoo! That was liberating. Don't worry what man can do to you. Stay focused on what God has spoken to you. God wasn't redirecting. A side road doesn't mean a new road. Guess what? They came into the office. They said, look, you got to go. Money rot reasons. We're having to, you know, let people go. And I, I didn't believe him. And I told him, I said, listen, if you're letting me go because of money, I understand. The economy's bad. I know the whole situation that's happening here in the ministry. I understand. But if you're letting me go for any other reason, in my mind, because I didn't turn my papers in, if you're letting me go for any other reason and you're not man enough to tell me that to my face, then I've lost all respect for you. I'm walking out of it. Now, again, I'm just sharing all this with you because you got to guard against it. I'm walking out of the door with all the boxes, all my time in Teen Challenges in a box, like on TV. And my Rolodex was sitting on top of the box. And as I'm walking out of the front door, Acme Lock is standing there changing all the locks in the building. And remember, three directors I've seen, they didn't change the locks on anybody. On the previous three directors, locks didn't get changed. I walked into the dining room. And there they are, Agme Lock is changing locks. 
And I looked at that, and I looked at them, and I said, yeah, right. As I'm walking out of the front door, he reaches in, one of them, grabs the Rolodex out of my box and said, these connections aren't yours. Weeks went by. I asked them if I, they were going to dissolve that teen challenge. I was told they were going to dissolve it. They weren't going to have a teen challenge anymore. Gail and I prayed. We felt like God told us to reincorporate. I had contacted them to try to get the mailing list. They wanted to sell me the mailing list. I'm saying all of that, I don't have a job. I'm a ship fitter by trade. What did I do? I got to pay, I got to pay notes on a house we're renting. I got to put food, you know, on the table. I went back to the shipyard. There's my point. A side road doesn't mean a new road. God was not calling me back to the shipyard. Amen. I just had to pay my bills for a while. I had to make some money while Gail and I stood still and here I got <laughs> Here we are. What's going to happen? What are we going to do? What's our life look like now? And while all of this needs to be re revealed to us, I had to, I had to go to work. I went back to the shipyard. Thank God for that. I enjoyed that work. <laughs> Side road doesn't mean a new road. Amen? Do not set a time limit on God to show up. We really mess ourselves up when we do that. We really mess ourselves up because more than likely it's not going to happen fast enough, soon enough, easy enough. And we're going to start making plans. Amen. It's like, all right, God, I don't know where you at, but I got to make some plans. No. Do not set a time limit. For God to show up. We had two great offers. One I didn't have to pray about. It was one of those godforsaken northern uh, uh, states. <laughs> Wisconsin or Wisconsin or Michigan. I, those weren't even of God. <laughs> 60 is cold to me. I didn't even have to pray about that one. But Frank Reynolds, God bless him. He knew the whole situation because I stayed in touch with our, you know, district, our national office daily. They knew everything. He called me up and he said, Greg, I have, I have it cleared. You just say yes. You can go to, I forgot, Michigan or Wisconsin. It wasn't Minnesota. Rich had that place all show, sewed up. But one of the other ones where it gets below and true, Maui Teen Challenge. All you got to do is say yes, and you can be at either one. I've already talked to the boards. You just say yes to either one of these offers, and you're there. Maui, I love scuba diving. We're talking blue water for the rest of my life. You're not, you're, you're not going to hear no unless you pray. <laughs> now, I didn't have to pray about Wisconsin or Minnesota, whichever one it was, but don't set a time limit. Don't get distracted. Amen? That'll be deadly. No, I didn't go to Hawaii. Gail and I prayed. And again, in my head, just as clear as day, man started at once, meaning a group of men incorporated the first teen challenge. Man can do it again. So Gail and I clearly heard to reincorporate the present teen challenge now today in 1987. Pray. I love this psalm. Psalms 121. Don't be afraid of the circumstances. God might be using them. And I, if I would have really been thinking hard, I would have underlined might about five times. God might be using them. Circumstances can be used by God to move us. Now, what am I talking about? Wait, you're, all this has been in prayer and all that. And all, well, fast forward now from 87. And I won't even go into all the stories of trying to rebuild the Franklin Avenue Center after it sat vacant in the Ninth Ward. Anatol will know, you know what that looked like. Five years that building sat vacant. All the crackheads. God used the crackheads to lower the property value so that we could come in and pay cash for it. Five years later. Amen. Joker, you think you're going to win? No, you ain't. God just used the crackheads to lower the property value for me. Now I can afford it. 
Um, but it took us five years of outpatient. All we did was refer. I lost Anatole because I didn't have a building. I had to send him to Memphis Teen Challenge. And my mistake was I sent him to a place that eats almost as good as New Orleans. And he never came home. And the Fred West, you know, and uh, all of the great guys, man, we sent up here. Just real quick, I didn't put this in the notes, but once we reopened, we had some major staffing, catastrophe staffing issues. We, our heart was to reopen. We worked for five years to reopen. We finally reopened, had major catastrophes with staff situations, and I had to close down. All of those years of praying, all of those years of working, I had to have a meeting with the students. We got to close down. Y'all have two choices. Go home or pack your stuff up and get in the van. I've already talked to Doug Desertel. I'm driving you to Memphis Teen Challenge. And half went home and half got in the van. And we drove up here. That drive back was hor the, the whole It was horrible. So so deflating. We thought we had gotten there. After all of those steps, we thought we got there. Oh, God. Circumstances. God might be using it. All right, so now all of that, then we get uh, 2005, Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> yeah, it just keeps getting great. That's why I put circumstances can be used by God. We got six and a half feet of water in our building. We didn't have flood insurance. The building was paid for. We weren't mandated by a mortgage to have flood insurance. We weren't in a flood zone at the time that since changed after Katrina. Duh. But, you know, I mean, Hurricane uh, Betsy was a horrible hurricane. That didn't even flood our building. We weren't in a flood zone at the time. It just made, to us, it made better sense of God's money. We had all the other insurances, you know, property, wind, you know, liability. We had all, we didn't have flood. We weren't in a flood zone. We never flooded. The most horrible floods, May 3rd flood, whatever, 83 or whatever, that didn't flood, you know, the center. Katrina put six and a half feet of water in our building. We had $100,000 worth of uh Printing material, as one of our light industries, we had an offset printing uh, company in the building. Lost it all. Totaled it. The whole city, I mean, y'all know, probably know the story. We lost 80% of our mail-in contributions. We had no other light industry across the state. We only had New Orleans Teen Challenge at the time. Well, we did have the second phase, but that was really not off the ground yet. We lost 80% of our mail-in contributions overnight. Boom, gone. Nothing coming in the mail. No light industry. I remember sitting on the steps outside of the building in a driveway just with my hands, my face in my hands. God. The city, honestly, the city didn't even know if it was coming back. Literally, there was talk of New Orleans not being in existence. So where does that leave me? Where does that leave New Orleans Teen Challenge? And again, the whole point I'm making is circumstances can get our attention. It helps us to evaluate ourselves. It would have taken a Katrina to get me out of New Orleans. Talk about DNA. New Orleans Teen Challenge is Greg Dill. That's, that's me. Thank God for all the other sinners. But if I have to attach myself to one, it's New Orleans Teen Challenge. And it would have taken a Katrina for me to even consider not being there. Here we go, though. Circumstances should not dictate the will of God. Just because of Katrina, just because I'm not sure if the city is going to let me come back, just because of all of that doesn't mean it was time for me to pick up stakes and go. What it means is, okay, God, <laughs> speak. Circumstances should never be a substitute for God's voice. I didn't know for months, I didn't know what God's plan was. Now, I don't know if Gail will remember this. I hope she does. It was powerful to me. We didn't know what to do. 
we're up in North Louisiana. We really like it. My kids were, you know, had to get transferred into school in North Louisiana. We're at our men's second phase center, living there in a cabin meant for students. I got five people in one cabin in one bathroom. Six. Well, that's right. We, yeah, we had, we had a, uh, a guy living with us. In church, I'm praying. I've been praying. From day one, I've been praying. In church, I remember I had my hands lifted. I'm worshiping God. And again, in my mind, loud, I heard, go back. Rebuild. And I remember looking over at Gail. And I said, God just spoke to me. We're going back. And I'm coming to the point, I'm trying to watch the time, we're going to get to this. You've got to have somebody, if someone's tired of you, you've got to have somebody that you can look to and say, God said, go back. And she has a spirituality to hear it too and say, okay, let's do it. Let's roll. We don't know what it's going to look like. How is it going to happen? I don't know. But we heard say, God, go back. God said, go back. Circumstances didn't tell me to not go back. Circumstances made me sit for a minute and say, okay, God, if anything's going to get me to move, it would be this. Is this you? So it's okay to look at the circumstances, but don't let the circumstances dictate God's voice. Don't let it substitute God's voice. God doesn't need circumstances to speak. He can get to maneuver you. But he's got a voice, amen? He can speak. Here we go. This is what, see the water line right there. That's our dining room. That's my office. You see the black mold came in days. Thank God for Chattanooga Teen Challenge. Three times they came with students and mucked out our building I can't even tell you how many piles like this it smelled so bad I'm not exaggerating those poor students they were all with hazmat suits we, we didn't know we didn't know we needed to get shots to go to New Orleans to work because of all the death that was in the water literally so we all got hazmat suits they, it smelled so bad they they would have to go outside on a, out on the street take the mask off, vomit, put the mask back on their face and go back inside and keep carrying stuff out. I, can't, I lost track of how many piles like that we took out of that building. Here's our kitchen. Note to self, if you ever have a chance of a flood, empty your grease out of your fryer. Oh, man. Well, oil floats on water, grease floats on water. All of the grease in the deep fry, two deep fryers commercial deep fryers, floated up six feet with the water, and guess what happened when the water receded? Oh, coated everything. Nasty grease. Oh, did that stink. Oh, it was terrible. All right, there's our dining room now. Boom. God. Come on, God. From here to here, God. Rats. I'm lost in pictures. We'll see. Maybe so. Maybe Gail's right. See, I said maybe. She probably is right. Rats. Hate when your wife's right, huh? That stinks. She's right. Look under the hills. Don't panic. <laughs> I love this one. Second Chronicles 23. If you're a pastor, you probably preached that. If you're a teen challenge, you might have preached that. I love how it starts out. And Jehoshaphat feared. If you know the story, this joker, he was dead. In the natural, there's absolutely no chance of survival. 
you go to Second Chronicles chapter 19, it just, it, just, it just shows you the whole dire strait that that guy was in. It was like 2,000 to 1 people encamped around him. In the natural, they were dead. We as humans, and as a disaster, will likely bring a human response. Whether it's fear or doubt, there may be that initial I'm not telling you there wasn't an initial, amen? I mean, we're human. Something's wrong with you. You're taking volumes, and you shouldn't be. Stop. If you don't have an initial response. There was doubt. There was 80% gone. How are we going to survive? I mean, you, you can't help but have those thoughts. You're, you're, you're brain dead. You shouldn't even be in, in any kind of leadership if you don't have some kind of a thought pattern. Don't start scrambling. If you know the story, Jehoshaphat did not gather all of his strategic battle planners. You know they had them. We see other examples of how they, they, all, they, they devised plans. There was no plan for this one. This situation was way too dire. There was no human plan going to work. Don't start scrambling. Sit still long enough to hear from God. I already told you, rebuild. I don't know how that's going to happen. It took me five years to rebuild Franklin Avenue from just the crackheads. I don't, how, I don't know. How, we're praying. We know God told us to. All right, God, show up. Show up. Recovering steps, it's in God's timing. This is it after we cleaned up. That's clean. A pastor came up to him. He says, Greg, you don't know me, but I'm going to tell you what God spoke to my heart. He spoke to me so clearly, you can't say no. I've already talked to my board. They've already given me permission to take time off from the pulpit. God spoke to me and told me to be in control of your rebuild. I am your construction manager. Say yes. <laughs> we had never met. Don Hicks. He said, I'm going to tell you how. God already told me how we're going to do it. We took out every wall downstairs of that building. Anatol knows the building. Jonathan's been there. We, our, store, our attic is 8, 10 foot. That's in all essence, a three-story building. We took every wall out down. This is, this is Teen Challenge people. No one had a degree. We didn't have any plans. We didn't have any permits from the city because there was no city. We went down there without zero permission to do what we did. Took out every wall. We placed it with cinder block. And now we got that. Now we tied in what wood is up there. It will never get. Six and a half feet is already proven. That's it. That's as deep as our area is going to get. Because they didn't stop the flood until the water leveled off. They put a man on the moon, but they couldn't figure out how to stop a leak. <laughs> Literally. Huh? Where were the sea bees, Navy guy? Come on, man. That six and a half feet is our level. So we know it's never going to get to the second story. Tidal wave won't get to us. That was a Chalmette problem, but tidal wave, this was just all flood water got up. So anyway, we tied with stucco, we tied the cinder block into the wood, and now it just looked like one nice building. What if I'd have panicked? What if I'd have scrambled? What if I'd have gone somewhere else? What if I'd have done something else? Then I wouldn't have been able to enjoy that story. Amen? Here we go. I'm getting to the end. If you're not married yet, I can't stress enough how important it is to marry someone who has the same general calling. Going back to Gail, she had a calling to Teen Challenge. Not specific like New Orleans, but she was down for the call because it was Teen Challenge. We have some staff whether it's a husband or wife, they're bivocational. 
our director in, in uh, Shreveport, wonderful man of God. His wife's a nurse. Actually, uh, Nathan, too. Two directors. Their wives are nurses. I'm not saying that there, it might be, would be easier for them. I haven't been involved in their personal conversations at the house, but I know it's working out for them. So even though she's a nurse, she still has that general same calling enough to where she's allowing her husband to function in a teen challenge capacity. Amen? But when married, disaster strikes, God will speak to both of you about how to proceed. And it's so much easier to continue when both have the same confirmation. And that's going to be hard for the spouse, man or woman, to have the same confirmation if they don't have the same calling. Does that make sense? I mean, what are you praying about? If you don't have the same calling, you're not necessarily praying about the same thing. And if you're not praying about the same thing, how are you going to get the same answer? If Gail hadn't, when I leaned over and said, God told us to rebuild, God told us to go back, God told us to do it again, or uh, Maui looks good, but uh, God said reincorporate. Really? <laughs> she did not say that. She, every step of the way, every step of the way, never once did we argue over the move, what our next step is, right? Correct me. Never once did we argue. Never once was it, ah, you know, never once, it, ah, I'm going to have to pray. Never once, never once. Apart from God's power, you and your spouse will be each other's greatest strength. I might have wrote this in my own personal notes. Um, let me go back to A. I'm looking around the room. I don't know. Some of y'all are old enough to be married. I don't know if you are or not. If you're not, let me tell you what's really important. And you Teen Challenge guys or even pastors might have counseled you young people this way. Before you decide to get married, you better both figure out what your calling is. Because unless you're already married and maybe you got married before each other, y'all knew Christ, then y'all come to Christ, then God will have a... Because He knew that. He knew that you were going to be married when you came to Christ. So His calling is going to be for both of y'all. Does that make sense? But if you're not married, you need to figure out what your individual calling is. You need to have a clear, Gail clearly knew she was not to be a pastor's wife. I clearly knew. And then we got those notes together, and then we were okay with that. And we proceeded. And we've been strong for 40 years through, I think y'all can see some pretty nasty stuff. Greatest strength, apart from God, you and your spouse being hand in hand. Two or more agree. Amen? You and your wife are two or more. Gail's 15. I got 16 people when I pray. One of me and 15 of her. Strong Yankee girl. <laughs> I got three minutes. I found this as an illustration. It's, it's great. Again, most of us will probably know the story. Paul being stoned in Lystra. Thought he was dead. Drug him outside the city. He woke up. What did he do? That joker went right back into the city to preach the gospel that just stoned him. How in the world do you do that? He didn't hear God say anything different. Amen? He didn't feel like his job was done. Paul and Barnabas had been expelled from Antioch and Physida, threatened in Iconium, actually stoned in Lystra, but yet when God raises Paul up, they go right back into the same cities to strengthen the disciples in that city. They didn't feel their job was, take, was, was done. That was just a little side hiccup getting stoned to death. 
Oh, wait, hold up. I'm not done. This kind of courage only comes from a trust in a living God. Until God, and this is my point, until God was done with Paul and Barnabas, there was no stopping them. They understood the truth. You have decided the length of our days. You know how many months we'll live, and we're not given a minute longer. So you're in control of all of that. If you're not done in this Lystra, then we're not done. You're in charge. Paul got up, walked right back into the city where he'd been stoned. They strangled. Young servants in Lystra and Barnabas were even involved in this persecution. I think it's remarkable how the New Testament writers, and Luke's writing this, and where this one came out of, concentrate on the depth of their joint sufferings. They look on them. This is incredible. He just gave it, it's just sort of like, oh yeah, he got up and he walked back into the city. He didn't really elaborate. They looked on him as a necessary part of their ministry and almost just shrugged it off. Like, oh yeah, okay, we got stoned. Oh, yeah, no big, go preach. <laughs> I hope we can get to that place, amen? Where Katrina just, come. all right, well, re rebuild, let's go. You know, we have to take a break from having residence there for a while, but let's go. Paul didn't get mad at God. He's serving Christ, and the people stoned him for it. This is the question I'm going to leave you with. Would you question God if something like that happened to you? Wouldn't We would have the tendency to wonder why God didn't protect me from this situation. I mean, after all, I'm preaching the gospel. Paul didn't even complain. He just keeps on doing what God has called him to do. Preach the gospel. So a disappointment comes. A Katrina disaster comes. Don't let it derail you. It doesn't have to derail you. It didn't derail Paul. And I mean, we know two-thirds of the New Testament got written because he did not get derailed. He, Romans, you know, I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we probably know that one. All the list of stuff that happened to him, he did not get derailed. Don't let disaster derail you. If you don't, maybe you get to be the CEO with the mic in your hand. Amen? Just outlast everybody else. Jonathan. <laughs> Stay up here if you, want. you should have in your, uh, in your bags uh, note cards. So uh, as we are going through today, um, if you have a question, we're going to try to take about 10 minutes at the end of every session to do question and answer. And then we've got a great panel with a lot of experience that we're going to take about the last half hour and do question and answer. So feel free to write those down, and we'll take some time uh, at the end um, of each session uh, to, to uh, ask some questions. I have one that somebody handed to me, and, and um, I'll let you answer this. Um, how do you deal with disaster in the lives of the addicts that you're called to? Not all of them turn out to be angels. How do you deal with that over decades and still keep the faith? It's hard to answer this, in my opinion, honestly, and not sound, sound callous. Wide is a road that leads to destruction. Many go thereof. Narrow is a road that leads to heaven. Few go thereof. And I'll be completely transparent with you. We pour our heart into every student that comes in, even the knuckleheads. You get the Jennifers, you get the Anatols, the ones that make it all worthwhile. That carries you on. But the difficult ones know you've done your best. And in staff training, I told a student, a staff, Look, if we dismiss a student and we can't be 100% convinced that we did everything that we could to pour into their life before we dismissed them, shame on us. I rebuke you. But if we know we have done the best we can and they leave, give us a middle finger on the way out the door. Somebody, has that happened? Maybe we've been around too long. Or we end up dismissing them because it's the right decision. Paul kicked the guy out of the church because he refused to stop sleeping with his mother-in-law. It's the right thing to do. That's just a whole other teaching. We just know that it was, we tried our best. And again, without sounding callous, 
and the staff have heard me say this in New Orleans, it's like, next? A bed just opened up. Next? I did the best I could with him. My heart breaks for him because I know his chances of survival is going to be greatly limited, if not zeroed out because he left us. But I can't do anything about it. I tried. I can't do anything about it. Let me focus on a guy coming in the door. Next. So it may sound callous, but over the years, I just, you know, that's how I've consoled myself. And I also know, let me just, this is a good point. Directors or any other staff that might be involved in that, or maybe a pastor of a church, you may, and it's harder. I wouldn't be a pastor because I can kick somebody out of Teen Challenge a lot quicker than I can kick them out of a church. Um, but, <laughs> but I have consoled myself, whether it was Greg doing a good job counseling or the Holy Ghost. Um, and I've said this to staff, listen, God's bigger than our decision. And so, in 40 years of dismissing people, and even with the other centers, I'll get phone calls on the hard cases, what to do, and I'll say dismiss them, dismiss her. So I'm involved in all of the centers, but specifically in New Orleans over the years. I, I know that my, some of my dismissals were wrong. It was the wrong decision. For whatever reason, flesh, tired, misread, wrong. But how I survived that knowledge and how I counseled the newer staff, God's bigger than my bad decision. If that person's heart is truly to do good, God is bigger than my wrong decision. And that individual will wind up in a program far better than mine. They'll, be in a, they'll land in a place better than I could have ever given them. God will reward them by me kicking them out in a wrong place. And i got to believe that, that God's bigger than my bad decisions. And God's going to protect that individual, you know, beyond what Greg, you know, uh, the wrong decision he made. So I hope that helps. Um, we just, not everybody that comes into your building God brought. Sometimes Satan, I'm convinced of that, brought that guy. <laughs> I mean, you got, if you live there, you know what I'm saying, but, you know, and it's humorous, but I'm telling you, some of them were the devil. And you will have students tell you how different the atmosphere after so-and-so's gone. That ain't natural. That's supernatural, demonic activity. And they could just sense the difference. So you know you're doing the right thing when you do that. So I hope that answers the question.